Section One of the Square Egg and Other Sketches by Saki. The Square Egg, a badger's eye view of the mud war in the trenches. Assuredly, a badger is the animal that one most resembles in this trench warfare, that drab coated creature of the twilight and darkness, digging, burrowing, listening keeping itself as clean as possible under unfavourable circumstances, fighting tooth and nail on occasion for possession of a few yards of honeycombed earth. What the badger thinks about life we shall never know, which is a pity but cannot be helped. It's difficult enough to know what one thinks about oneself in the trenches. Parliament taxes, social gatherings, economies and expenditure, and all the thousand and one horrors of civilization seem immeasurably remote and the war itself seems almost as distant and unreal. A couple of hundred yards away, separated from you by a stretch of dismal, untidy-looking ground, and some strips of rusty wire entanglement, lies a vigilant, bullet-splitting enemy. Lurking and watching in those opposing trenches are foemen who might stir the imagination of the most sluggish brain, descendants of the men who went to battle under Moltke, Blücher, Frederick the Great, and the Great Elector. Wallenstein, Maurice of Saxony, Barbarossa, Albert the Bear, Henry the Lion, Witkin the Saxon. They're matched against you there, man for man and gun for gun, in what is perhaps the most stupendous struggle that modern history has known. And yet one thinks remarkably little about them. It would not be advisable to forget, for the fraction of a second that they are there, but one's mind does not dwell on their existence. One speculates little as to whether they are drinking warm soup and eating sausage, or going cold and hungry, whether they are well supplied with copies of the Megendorfer Blätter and other light literature, or bored with unutterable weariness. Much more to be thought about than the enemy over yonder or the war all over Europe is the mud of the moment, the mud that at times engulfs you as cheese engulfs a cheese mite. In zoological gardens one has gazed at an elk or bison loitering at its pleasure, more than knee-deep in a quagmire of greasy mud, and one has wondered what it would feel like to be soused and plastered, hour long, in such a muck-bath. One knows now. In narrow dug support trenches, when thaw and heavy rain have come suddenly atop of a frost, when everything is pitch dark around you and you can only stumble about and feel your way against streaming mud walls, when you have to go down on hands and knees in several inches of soup like mud to creep into a dugout, when you stand deep in mud, lean against mud, grasp mud slimed objects with mud caked fingers, wink mud away from your eyes and shake it out of your ears, bite muddy biscuits with muddy teeth, then at least you are in a position to understand thoroughly what it feels like to wallow. On the other hand, the bison's idea of pleasure becomes more and more incomprehensible. When one is not thinking about mud, one is probably thinking about estaminet, and estaminet is a haven that one finds in agreeable plenty in most of the surrounding townships and villages, flourishing still amid roofless and deserted houses patched up where necessary in rough and ready fashion and finding a new and profitable tide of customers from among the soldiers who have replaced the bulk of the civil population. An estaminet is a sort of compound between a wine shop and a coffee house, having a tiny bar in one corner, a few long tables and benches, a prominent cooking stove, generally a small grocery store tucked away in the back premises, and always two or three children running and bumping about at inconvenient angles to one's feet. It seems to be a fixed rule that estaminet children should be big enough to run about and small enough to get between one's legs. There must, by the way, be one considerable advantage in being a child in a war zone village. No one can attempt to teach it tidiness. The wearisome maxim, a place for everything and everything in its proper place, can never be insisted on when a considerable part of the roof is lying in the back yard, when a bedstead from a neighbour's demolished bedroom is half buried in the beetroot pile and the chickens are roosting in a derelict meat safe because a shell has removed the top and sides and front of the chicken house. Perhaps there is nothing in the foregoing description to suggest that a village wine shop frequently a shell nibbled building in a shell gnawed street is a paradise to dream about. 
but where one has lived in a dripping wilderness of unrelieved mud and sodden sandbanks for any length of time one's mind dwells on the plain furnished parlour with its hot coffee and vin ordinaire as something warm and snug and comforting in a wet and slushy world to the soldier on his trench to billet's migration the wine shop is what the tavern rest house is to a caravan nomad of the east one comes and goes in a crowd of chance foregathered men noticed or unnoticed as one wishes amid the khaki clad beputtied throng of one's own kind one can be as unobtrusive as a green caterpillar on a green cabbage leaf one can sit undisturbed alone or with one's own friends or if one wishes to be talkative and talk too one can readily find a place in a circle where men of diverse variety of cap badges are exchanging experiences real or improvised besides the changing throng of mud-stained khaki there is a drifting leaven of local civilians uniformed interpreters and men in varying types of foreign military garb from privates in the regular army to heaven knows what in some intermediate corps that only an expert in such matters could put a name to and of course here and there are representatives of their great army of adventurer purse sappers that carries on its operations uninterruptedly in time of peace and war alike over the greater part of the earth's surface you meet them in england and france in russia and constantinople probably they are to be met also in iceland though on that point i have no direct evidence in the estaminet of the fortunate rabbit i found myself sitting next to an individual of indefinite age and nondescript uniform who was obviously determined to make the borrowing of a match serve as a formal introduction and a banker's reference he had the air of jaded jauntiness the equipment of temporary amiability the aspect of a foraging crow taught by experience to be wary and prompted by necessity to be bold he had the contemplative downward droop of nose and moustache and the furtive sidelong range of eye he had all those things that are the ordinary outfit of the purse sapper the world over i am a victim of the war he exclaimed after a little preliminary conversation one cannot make an omelette without breaking eggs i answered with the appropriate callousness of a man who had seen some dozens of square miles of devastated countryside and roofless homes eggs he vociferated but it is precisely about eggs that i am about to speak have you ever considered what is the great drawback in the excellent and most useful egg the ordinary everyday egg of commerce and cookery but its tendency to age rapidly is sometimes against it i hazarded unlike the united states of north america which grow more respectable and self-respecting the longer they last an egg gains nothing by persistence it resembles your louis the fifteenth who declined in popular favour every year he lived unless the historians have entirely misrepresented his record no replied the tavern acquaintance seriously it is not a question of age it is the shape the roundness consider how easily it rolls on a table a shelf a shop counter perhaps one little push and it may roll to the floor and be destroyed what catastrophe for the poor the frugal i gave a sympathetic shudder to the idea here eggs cost six sous apiece monsieur he continued it is a subject I had often pondered and turned over in my mind this economical malformation of the household egg in our little village of Verchet les Toteaux in the department of the Tarn my aunt has a small dairy and poultry farm from which we drew a modest income we were not poor but there was always the necessity to labour to contrive to be sparing one day I chanced to notice that one of my aunt's hens a hen of the mop-headed Houdin breed had laid an egg that was not altogether so round-shaped as the eggs of other hens it could not be called square but it had well-defined angles i found out that this particular bird always laid eggs of this particular shape the discovery gave a new stimulus to my ideas if one collected all the hens that one could find with a tendency to lay slightly angular egg and breed chickens only from those hens and went on selecting and selecting always choosing those that laid the squarest egg at last with patience and enterprise one would produce a breed of fowls that laid only square eggs in the course of several hundred years one might achieve such a result i said it would probably take several thousands uh, with your cold northern conservative slow-moving hens 
that might be the case said the acquaintance impatiently and rather angrily with our vivacious southern poultry it is different listen i searched i experimented i explored the poultry yards of our neighbors i ransacked the markets of the surrounding towns whenever i found a hen laying an angular egg i bought her i collected in time a vast concourse of fowls all sharing the same tendency from their progeny i selected only those pullets whose eggs showed the most marked deviation from the normal roundness i continued i persevered monsieur i produced a breed of hens that laid an egg which could not roll however much you might push or jostle it my experiment was more than a success it was one of the romances of modern industry of that i had not the least doubt but i did not say so my eggs became known continued the soi disant poultry farmer at first they were sought after as a novelty something curious bizarre then merchants and housewives began to see that they were a utility an improvement and advantage over the ordinary kind i was able to command a sale for my wares at a price considerably above market rates i began to make money i had a monopoly i refused to sell any of my square layers and the eggs that went to market were carefully sterilized so that no chickens should be hatched from them i was in a way to become rich comfortably rich then this war broke out which has brought misery to so many i was obliged to leave my hens and my customers and go to the front my aunt carried on the business as usual sold the square eggs the eggs i had devised and created and perfected and received the profits can you imagine it she refuses to send me one centime of the takings she says that she looks after the hens and pays for their corn and sends the eggs to market and that the money is hers legally of course it is mine if i could afford to bring a process in the courts i could recover all the money that the eggs have brought in since the war commenced many thousands of francs to bring a process would only need a small sum i have a lawyer friend who would arrange matters cheaply for me unfortunately i have not sufficient funds in hand i need still about eighty francs in wartime alas it is difficult to borrow i had always imagined that it was a habit that was especially indulged in during wartime and said so on the big scale yes but i am talking of a very small matter it is easier to arrange a loan of millions than of a trifle of eighty or ninety francs the would-be financier paused for a few terse moments then he recommenced in a more confidential strain some of you english soldiers i have heard are men with private means is it not so it is perhaps possible that among your comrades there might be someone willing to advance a small sum you yourself perhaps it would be a secure and profitable investment quickly repaid if i get a few days leave i will go down to vichy les Toto and inspect the square egg hen farm i said gravely and question the local egg merchants as to the position and prospects of the business the tavern acquaintance gave an almost imperceptible shrug to his shoulders lifted in his seat and began moodily to roll a cigarette his interest in me had suddenly died out but for the sake of appearances he was bound to make a perfunctory show of winding up the conversation he had so laboriously started ah you will go to vichy les Toto and make inquiries about our farm and if you find what i have told you about the square eggs is true monsieur what then i shall marry your aunt end of section one section two birds on the western front considering the enormous economic dislocation which the war operations have caused in the regions where the campaign is raging there seems to be very little corresponding disturbance in the bird life of the same districts rats and mice have been mobilized and swarmed into the fighting line and there has been a partial mobilization of owls particularly barn owls following in the wake of the mice and making laudable efforts to thin out their numbers what success attends their hunting one cannot estimate there are always sufficient mice left over to populate one's dugout and make a parade ground and race course of one's face at night 
in the matter of nesting accommodation the barn owls are well provided for most of the still intact barns in the war zone are requisitioned for billeting purposes but there is a wealth of ruined houses whole streets and clusters of them such as can hardly have been available at any previous moment of the world's history since Nineveh and Babylon became humanly desolate without human occupation and cultivation there can have been no corn no refuse and consequently very few mice and the owls of Nineveh cannot have enjoyed very good hunting here in northern France the owls have desolation and mice at their disposal in unlimited quantities and as these birds breed in winter as well as in summer there should be a goodly output of war owlets to cope with the swarming generations of war mice apart from the owls one cannot notice that the campaign is making any marked difference in the bird life of the countryside the vast flocks of crows and ravens that one expected to find in the neighbourhood of the fighting line are non-existent which is perhaps rather a pity the obvious explanation is that the roar and crash and fumes of high explosives have driven the crow tribe in panic from the fighting area like many obvious explanations it is not a correct one the crows of the locality are not attracted to the battlefield but they certainly are not scared away from it the rook is normally so gun-shy and nervous where noise is concerned that the sharp banging of a barn door or the report of a toy pistol will sometimes set an entire rookery in commotion out here I have seen him sedately busy among the refuse heaps of a battered village with shells bursting at no great distance and the impatient sounding snapping rattle of machine guns going on all round him for all the notice that he took he might have been in some peaceful English meadow on a sleepy Sunday afternoon whatever else German frightfulness may have done it has not frightened the rook of northeastern France it has made his nerves steadier than they have ever been before and future generations of small boys employed in scaring rooks away from sown crops in this region will have to invent something in the way of super frightfulness to achieve their purpose crows and magpies are nesting well within the shell-swept area and over a small beech copse I once saw a pair of crows engaged in hot combat with a pair of sparrowhawks while considerably higher in the sky but almost directly above them two allied warplanes were engaging an equal number of enemy aircraft unlike the barn owls the magpie have had their choice of building sites considerably restricted by the ravages of war the whole avenues of poplars where they were accustomed to construct their nests have been blown to bits leaving nothing but dreary looking rows of shattered and splintered trunks to show where once they stood affection for a particular tree has in one case induced a pair of magpies to build their bulky domed nest in the battered remnants of a poplar of which so little remained standing that the nest looked almost bigger than the tree the effect rather suggested an archiepiscopal enthronement taking place in the ruined remains of Melrose Abbey the magpie wary and suspicious in his wild state must be rather intrigued by the change that has come over the erstwhile fearsome not to be avoided human stalking everywhere over the earth as its possessor who now creeps about in screened and sheltered ways as chary of showing himself in the open as the shyest of wild creatures the buzzard that earnest seeker after mice does not seem to be taking any war risks at least I have never seen one out here but kestrels hover about all day in the hottest parts of the line not in the least disconcerted apparently when a promising mouse area suddenly rises in the air in a cascade of black or yellow earth sparrowhawks are fairly numerous and a mile or two back from the firing line I saw a pair of hawks that I took to be red-legged falcons circling over the top of an oak copse according to investigations made by Russian naturalists the effect of the war on bird life on the Eastern Front has been more marked than it has been over here during the first year of the war rooks disappeared larks no longer sang in the fields the wild pigeon disappeared also the skylark in this region has stuck tenaciously to the meadows and croplands that have been seamed and bisected with trenches and honeycombed with shell holes in the chill misty hour of gloom that precedes a rainy dawn 
when nothing seemed alive except a few wary waterlogged sentries and many scuttling rats the lark would suddenly dash skyward and pour forth a song of ecstatic jubilation that sounded horribly forced and insincere it seemed scarcely possible that the bird could carry its insouciance to the length of attempting to rear a brood in that desolate wreckage of shattered clods and gaping shell-holes but once having occasion to throw myself down with some abruptness on my face I found myself nearly on top of a brood of young larks two of them had already been hit by something and were in a rather battered condition but the survivors seemed as tranquil and comfortable as the average nestling at the corner of a stricken wood which has had a name made for it in history but shall be nameless here at a moment when lyddite and shrapnel and machine-gun fire swept and raked and bespattered that devoted spot as though the artillery of an entire division had suddenly concentrated on it a wee hen chaffinch flitted wistfully to and fro amid splintered and falling branches that had never a green bough left on them the wounded lying there if any of them noticed the small bird may well have wondered why anything having wings and no pressing reason for remaining should have chosen to stay in such a place there was a battered orchard alongside the stricken wood and the probable explanation of the bird's presence was that it had a nest of young ones whom it was too scared to feed too loyal to desert later on a small flock of chaffinches blundered into the wood which they were doubtless in the habit of using as a highway to their feeding grounds unlike the solitary hen bird they made no secret of their desire to get away as fast as their dazed wits would let them the only other bird i ever saw there was a magpie flying low over the wreckage of fallen tree limbs one for sorrow says the old superstition there was enough sorrow in that wood the english gamekeeper whose knowledge of wildlife usually runs on limited and perverted lines has evolved a sort of religion as to the nervous debility of the hardiest game birds according to his beliefs a terrier trotting across a field in which a partridge is nesting or a mouse hawking kestrel hovering over the hedge is sufficient cause to drive the distracted bird off its eggs and send it whirring into the next county the partridge of the war zone shows no signs of such sensitive nerves the rattle and rumble of transport, the constant coming and going of bodies of troops, the incessant rattle of musketry and deafening explosions of artillery, the night-long flare and flicker of star-shells, have not sufficed to scare the local birds away from their chosen feeding grounds, and to all appearances they have not been deterred from raising their broods. Gamekeepers who are serving with the colours might seize the opportunity to indulge in a little useful nature study. End of section two. Section three. The Gala Program, an unrecorded episode in Roman history. It was an auspicious day in the Roman calendar, the birthday of the popular and gifted young emperor Placidus Superbus. Everyone in Rome was bent on keeping high festival. The weather was at its best and naturally the imperial circus was crowded to its fullest capacity a few minutes before the hour fixed for the commencement of the spectacle a loud fanfare of trumpets proclaimed the arrival of caesar and amid the vociferous acclamations of the multitude the emperor took his seat in the imperial box as the shouting of the crowd died away an even more thrilling salutation could be heard in the near distance the angry impatient roaring and howling of the beasts caged in the imperial menagerie explain the program to me commanded the emperor having beckoned the master of ceremonies to his side that eminent official wore a troubled look a gracious caesar he announced a most promising and entertaining program has been devised and prepared for your august approval in the first place there is to be a chariot contest of unusual brilliancy and interest three teams that have never hitherto suffered defeat are to contend for the herculaneum trophy together with the purse which your imperial generosity has been pleased to add the chances of the competing teams are accounted to be as nearly as possible equal 
and there is much wagering among the populace. The black Thracians are perhaps the favourites. I know, I know, interrupted Caesar, who had listened to exhaustive talk on the same subject all the morning. What else is there on the programme? The second part of the programme, said the imperial official, consists of a grand combat of wild beasts, specially selected for their strength, ferocity, and fighting qualities. There will appear simultaneously in the arena fourteen Nubian lions and lionesses, five tigers, six Syrian bears, eight Persian panthers, and three North African ditto, a number of wolves and lynxes from the Teutonic forests, and seven gigantic wild bulls from the same region. There will also be wild swine of unexampled savageness, a rhinoceros from the Barbary coast, some ferocious man-apes, and a hyena reputed to be mad. It promises well, said the Emperor. It promised well, O Caesar, said the official dolorously. It promised marvellously well. But between the promise and the performance a cloud has arisen. A cloud? What cloud? queried Caesar, with a frown. The suffragetai, explained the official. They threatened to interfere with the chariot race. Oh, I'd like to see them do it, exclaimed the Emperor indignantly. I fear your imperial wish may be unpleasantly gratified, said the Master of Ceremonies. We are taking, of course, every possible precaution, and guarding all the entrances to the arena and the stables with a triple guard, but it is rumoured that at the signal for the entry of the chariots, five hundred women will let themselves down with ropes from the public seats and swarm all over the course. Naturally no race could be run under such circumstances, and the programme will be ruined. On my birthday, said Placidus Superbus, they would not dare to do such an outrageous thing. The more august the occasion, the more desirous they will be to advertise themselves and their cause, said the harassed official. They do not scruple to make riotous interference with even the ceremonies in the temples. Who are these suffragetai? asked the emperor. Since I came back from my Pannonian expedition, I have heard of nothing else but their excesses and demonstrations. They are a political sect of very recent origin, and their aim seems to be to get a big share of political authority into their hands. The means they are taking to convince us of their fitness to help in making and administering the laws consists of wild indulgences in tumult, destruction, and defiance of all authority. They have already damaged some of the most historically valuable of our public treasures, which can never be replaced. Is it possible that the sex which we hold in such honour, and for which we feel such admiration, can produce such hordes of furies? asked the Emperor. But it takes all sorts to make a sex, observed the Master of Ceremonies, who possessed a certain amount of worldly wisdom. Also, he concluded anxiously, it takes very little to upset a gala programme. Perhaps the disturbance that you anticipate will turn out to be an idle threat, said the Emperor consolingly. But if they should carry out their intention, said the official, the programme will be utterly ruined. The Emperor said nothing. Five minutes later the trumpets rang out for the commencement of the entertainment. A hum of excited anticipation ran through the ranks of the spectators, and final bets on the issues of the great race were hurriedly shouted. The gates leading from the stables were slowly swung open and a troop of mounted attendants rode round the track to ascertain that everything was clear for the momentous contest. Again the trumpets rang out, and then, before the foremost chariot had appeared, there arose a wild tumult of shouting, laughing, angry protests, and shrill screams of defiance. Hundreds of women were being lowered by their accomplices into the arena. A moment later they were running and dancing in frenzied troops across the track where the chariots were supposed to compete. No team of arena-trained horses would have faced such a frantic mob. The race was clearly an impossibility. Howls of disappointment and rage rose from the spectators. Howls of triumph echoed back from the women in possession. The vain efforts of the circus attendants to drive out the invading horde merely added to the uproar and confusion. As fast as the suffragetai were thrust away, from one portion of the track they swarmed on to another. The master of ceremonies was nearly delirious from rage and mortification. 
Placidus Superbus, who remained calm and unruffled as ever, beckoned to him, and spoke a word or two in his ear. For the first time that afternoon the sorely tried official was seen to smile. A trumpet rang out from the imperial box. An instant hush fell over the excited throng. Perhaps the Emperor, as a last resort, was going to announce some concession to the suffragatai. "'Close the stable gates,' commanded the Master of Ceremonies, "'and open all the menagerie dens. It is the imperial pleasure that the second portion of the programme be taken first. It turned out that the Master of Ceremonies had in no wise exaggerated the probable brilliancy of this portion of the spectacle. The wild bulls were really wild, and the hyena, reputed to be mad, thoroughly lived up to its reputation. End of Section 3 Section 4 The Infernal Parliament In an age when it has become increasingly difficult to accomplish anything new or original, Bafton Bidderdale interested his generation by dying of a new disease. We always knew he would do something remarkable one of these days, observed his aunts. He has justified our belief in him. But there is a section of humanity ever ready to refuse recognition to meritorious achievement, and a large and influential school of doctors asserted their belief that Bidderdale was not really dead. The funeral arrangements had to be held over until the matter was settled one way or the other, and the aunts went provisionally into half-mourning. Meanwhile, Bidderdale remained in hell as a guest, pending his reception on a more regular footing. "'If you're not really supposed to be dead,' said the authorities of that region, "'we don't want to seem in an indecent hurry to grab you. The theory that hell is in serious need of population is a thing of the past.' Why, to take your family alone, there are any number of Bidderdales on our books. As you may discover later, it is part of our system that relations should be encouraged to live together down here. From observations made in another world, we have abundant evidence that it promotes the ends we have in view. However, while you are a guest, we should like you to be treated with every consideration, and be shown anything that specially interests you. Of course, you'd like to see our Parliament. Have you a Parliament in hell? asked Bitterdale, in some surprise. Only quite recently. Of course, we've always had chaos, but not under parliamentary rules. Now, however, that Parliaments are becoming the fashion in Turkey and Persia, and I suppose before long in Afghanistan and China, it seemed rather ostentatious to stand outside the movement. That young fiend just going by is the member for East Brimstone. He'll be delighted to show you over the institution. You'll just be in time to hear the opening of a debate, said the member, as he led Bidderdale through a spacious outer lobby, decorated with frescoes representing the fall of man, the discovery of gold, the invention of playing cards, and other traditionally appropriate subjects. The member for Nether Furnace is proposing a motion that this house do arrogantly protest to the legislatures of earthly countries against the wrongful and injurious misuse of the word fiendish in application to purely human misdemeanours, a misuse tending to create a false and detrimental impression concerning the infernal regions. A feature of the Parliament chamber itself was its enormous size. The space allotted to members was small and very sparsely occupied, but the public galleries stretched away tier on tier as far as the eye could reach, and were packed to their utmost capacity. There seems to be a very great public interest in the debate, exclaimed Bidderdale. Members are excused from attending the debates if they so desire, the fiend proceeded to explain. It is one of their most highly valued privileges. On the other hand, constituents are compelled to listen to, throughout, to the, all the speeches. After all, you must remember, we are in hell. Bidderdale repressed a shudder, and turned his attention to the debate. Nothing, the fiend orator was observing, is more deplorable among the cultured races of the present day than the tendency to identify fiendhood 
in the most sweeping fashion with all manner of disreputable excesses excesses which can only be alleged against us on the merest legendary evidence vices which are exclusively or predominantly human are unblushingly described as inhuman and what is even more contemptible and ungenerous as fiendish if one investigates such statements as inhuman treatment of pit ponies or fiendish cruelties in the congo so frequently to be heard in our brother parliaments on earth one finds a cumulative and indispensable evidence that it is the human treatment of pit ponies and congo natives that is really in question and that no authenticated case of fiendish agency in these atrocities can be substantiated it is there perhaps a minor matter for complaint continued the orator that the human race frequently pays us the doubtful compliment of describing as devilish funny jokes which are neither funny nor devilish the orator paused and an oppressive silence reigned over the vast chamber what is happening whispered Bidderdale. five minutes hush explained his guide it is a sign that the speaker was listened to in silent approval which is the highest mark of appreciation that can be bestowed in pandemonium let's come into the smoking room will the motion be carried asked Bidderdale, wondering inwardly how sir edward grey would treat the protest if it reached the british parliament an entente with the infernal regions opened up a fascinating vista in which the foreign secretary's imagination might hopelessly lose itself carried of course not said the fiend in the infernal parliament all motions are necessarily lost in earthly parliaments nowadays nearly everything is found said bitterdale including salaries and travelling expenses he felt that at any rate he was probably the first member of his family to make a joke in hell by the way he added talking of earthly parliaments have you got the party system down here in hell impossible you see we have no system of rewards we have specialized so thoroughly on punishments that the other bench has been entirely neglected and besides government by delusion as you practice it in your parliament would be unworkable here i would be the last person to say anything against temptation naturally but we have a proverb down here in baiting a mouse trap with cheese always leave room for the mouse such a party cry for instance as your ninepence for fourpence would be absolutely inoperative it not only leaves no room for the mouse it leaves no room for the imagination you have a saying in your country i believe there's no fool like a damned fool all the fools down here are necessarily damned but you wouldn't get them to nibble at ninepence for fourpence couldn't they be scolded and lectured into believing it as a sort of moral and intellectual duty asked bitterdale we haven't all your facilities said the fiend we've nothing down here that exactly corresponds to you, the master of ellibank at this moment bitterdale's attention was caught by an item on a loose sheet of agenda paper vote on account of special hells ah he said i've often heard the expression there is a special hell reserved for such and such a type of person do tell me about them i'll show you one in the course of preparation said the fiend leading him down the corridor this one is designed to accommodate one of the leading playwrights of your nation you may observe scores of imps engaged in pasting notices of modern british plays into a huge press cutting book each under the name of the author alphabetically arranged the book will contain nearly half a million notices i suppose and it will form the sole literature supplied to this specially doomed individual bidderdale was not altogether impressed some dramatic authors wouldn't so very much mind spending an eternity poring over a book of contemporary press cuttings he observed the fiend laughing unpleasantly lowered his voice the letter s is missing for the first time bidderdale realized that he was in hell. End of section four.
Section 5 The Achievement of the Cat In the political history of nations it is no uncommon experience to find states and peoples which but a short time since were in bitter conflict and animosity with each other settle down comfortably on terms of mutual goodwill and even alliance. The natural history of the social developments of species affords a similar instance in the coming together of two once warring elements now represented by civilized man and the domestic cat. The fiercely waged struggle which went on between humans and felines in those far-off days when saber-toothed tiger and cave lion contended with primeval man has long ago been decided in favor of the most fitly equipped combatant, the thing with the thumb. And the descendants of the dispossessed family are relegated today, for the most part, to the wastelands of jungle and veldt, where an existence of self-effacement is the only alternative to extermination. But the Felix Catus, or whatever species was the ancestor of the modern domestic cat, a vexed question at present, by a masterstroke of adaptation avoided the ruin of its race, and captured a place in the very keystone of the conqueror's organization. For not as a bond-servant or dependent has this proudest of mammals entered the human fraternity, not as a slave like the beasts of burden, or a humble camp-follower like the dog. The cat is domestic only as far as suits its own ends. It will not be kenneled or harnessed, nor suffer any dictation as to its goings out or comings in. Long contact with the human race has developed in it the art of diplomacy, and no Roman cardinal of medieval days knew better how to ingratiate himself with his surroundings than a cat with a saucer of cream on its mental horizon. But the social smoothness, the purring innocence, the softness of the velvet paw may be laid aside at a moment's notice, and the sinuous feline may disappear in deliberate aloofness to a world of roofs and chimney stacks, where the human element is distanced and disregarded, or the innate savage spirit that helped its survival in the bygone days of tooth and claw may be summoned forth from beneath the sleek exterior, and the torture instinct, common alone to human and feline, may find free play in the death throes of some luckless bird or rodent. It is indeed no small triumph to have combined the untrammelled liberty of primeval savagery with the luxury which only a highly developed civilization can command, to be lapped in the soft stuffs that commerce has gathered from the far ends of the world, to bask in the warmth that labour and industry have dragged from the bowels of the earth, to banquet on the dainties that wealth has bespoken for its table, and withal to be a free son of nature a mighty hunter, a spiller of life-blood. This is the victory of the cat. But besides the credit of success, the cat has other qualities which compel recognition. The animal which the Egyptians worshipped as divine, and which the Romans venerated as a symbol of liberty, which Europeans in the Middle Ages anathematized as an agent of demonology, has displayed to all ages two closely blended characteristics, courage and self-respect. No matter how unfavourable the circumstances, both qualities are always to the fore. Confront a child, a puppy and a kitten with a sudden danger. The child will turn instinctively for assistance. The puppy will grovel in abject submission to the impending visitation. The kitten will brace its tiny body for a frantic resistance and dissociate the luxury-loving cat from the atmosphere of social comfort in which it usually contrives to move, and observe it critically under the adverse conditions of civilization, that civilization which can impel a man to the degradation of clothing himself in tawdry ribald garments and capering mountebanks dances in the streets for the earning of the few coins that keep him on the respectable or non-criminal side of society the cat of the slums and alleys. Starved, outcast, harried, still keeps amid the prowlings of its adversity the bold, free panther tread with which it paced of yore the temple courts of Thebes. 
still displays the self-reliant watchfulness which man has never taught it to lay aside. When its shifts and clever managings have not sufficed to stave off inexorable fate, when its enemies have proved too strong or too many for its defensive powers, it dies, fighting to the last, quivering with the choking rage or mastered resistance, and voicing in its death yell that agony of bitter remonstrance which human animals too have flung at the powers that may be. The last protest against a destiny that might have made them happy, and has not. End of section 5 Section 6 of The Square Egg The Old Town of Pskov Russia, at the present crisis of its history, not unnaturally, suggests to the foreign mind a land pervaded with discontent and disorder, and weighed down with depression. And it is certainly difficult to point to any quarter of the imperial dominions from which troubles of one sort or another are not reported. In the Novoi Vremya and other papers, a column is now devoted to the chronicling of disorders, as regularly as a British news sheet reports sporting events. It is the more agreeable, therefore, occasionally to make the acquaintance of another phase of Russian life, where the somberness of political mischance can be momentarily lost sight of, or disbelieved in. Perhaps there are few spots in European Russia where one so thoroughly feels that one has passed into a new and unfamiliar atmosphere as the old town of Pskov, once in its day a very important centre of Russian life. To the average modern Russian, a desire to visit Pskov is an inexplicable mental freak on the part of a foreigner who wishes to see something of the country he's living in. Petersburg, Moscow, Kiev, perhaps, and Nizhny Novgorod, or the Finnish watering places if you want a country holiday. But why Pskov? And thus, Happily, an aversion to beaten tracks and localities where inspection is invited and industriously catered for turns one towards the old Great Russian border town, which probably gives as accurate a picture as can be obtained of a medieval Russian burg, untouched by Mongol influence and only slightly affected by Byzantine imported culture. The little town has ample charm of situation and structure standing astride a bold scarp of land wedged into the fork of two rivers, and retaining yet much of the long lines of ramparts and towers that served for many a hundred years to keep out pagan Lithuanians and marauding Teuton knights. The powers of darkness were as carefully guarded against in those days as more tangible human enemies, and from out of thick clusters of treetops there still arise the white walls and green roofs on many churches, monasteries and bell-towers, quaint and fantastic in architecture, and delightfully harmonious in colouring. Steep, winding streets lead down from the rampart-girt heart of the town to those parts which lie along the shores of the twin rivers, and two bridges, one a low, wide, wooden structure, primitively planted on piles, give access to the further banks where more towers and monasteries with other humbler buildings continue the outstraggling span of the township. On the rivers lie barges with high masts painted in wonderful bands of scarlet, green, white and blue, topped with gilded wooden pennons, figured somewhat like a child's rattle, and fluttering strips of bunting at their ends. Up in the town one sees on all sides quaint old doorways, deep archways, wooden gable ends, railed staircases, and a crowning touch of pleasing colour in the sage green or dull red of the roofs. But it is strangest of all to find a human population in complete picturesque harmony with its rich old world setting. The scarlet or blue blouses that are worn by the working men in most Russian towns give way here to a variety of gorgeous tinted garments, and the womenfolk are similarly gay in their apparel, so that streets and wharves and marketplace glow with wonderfully effective groupings of colour. Mulberry, orange, dull carmine, 
faded rose, hyacinth purple, greens and lilacs and rich blues mingle their hues on shirts and shawls, skirts and breeches and waistbands. Nature competing with Percy Anderson was the frivolous comment that came to one's mind, and certainly medieval crowd could scarcely have been more effectively staged. And the building of a town in which it seemed always market day went forward with an air of contented absorption on the part of the inhabitants. Strings of primitively fashioned carts went to and from the riverside. The horses wearing their bits for the most part hung negligently under the chin, a fashion that prevails in many parts of Russia and Poland. Quaint little booths line the sides of some of the steeper streets, and here wooden toys and earthenware pottery of strange local patterns are set out for sale. On the broad marketplace women sit gossiping by the side of large baskets of strawberries. One or two long-legged foals sprawl at full stretch under the shade of their parental market carts. And an extremely contented pig pursues his leisurely way under the guardianship of an elderly dame robed in a scheme of orange, mulberry and white that would delight the soul of a colorist. A stalwart peasant strides across the uneven cobbles, leading his plough horse, and carrying on his shoulder a small wooden plough with iron-tipped chairs that must date back to some stage of agriculture that the West has long left behind. Down in the buoyant waters of the Velikaya, the larger of the two rivers, youths and men are disporting themselves, and stader washerwomen are rinsing and smacking piles of many-hued garments. It is pleasant to swim well out into the stream of the river, and with one's chin on a level with the wide stretch of water, to take a trout's eye view of the little town, ascending in tiers of wharfage trees, grey ramparts, moor trees, and clustered roofs, with the old cathedral of the Trinity poised guardian-like above the crumbling walls of the Kremlin. The cathedral, on closer inspection, is a charming specimen of genuine old Russian architecture, full of rich carvings and aglow with scarlet pigment and gilded scrollwork, and stored with yet older relics or pseudo-relics of local hero-saints and hero-princes who helped in their day to make the history of the Pskov Commonwealth. After an hour or two spent among these tombs and icons, the memorials of dead Russia, one feels that some time must elapse before one cares to enter again the drearily magnificent holy places of St. Petersburg, with their depressing nouveau riche atmosphere, their priceless tongued attendance, and general lack of historic interest. The heart knoweth its own bitterness, and maybe the Poscoffier, amid their seeming contentment and self-absorption, have their own hungering for a new and happier era of national life. But the stranger does not ask to see so far. He is thankful to have found a picturesque and apparently well-contented corner of a weary land, a land where distress seems like a bird of passage that has hurt its wing and cannot fly away. End of section 6 Section 7 of The Square Egg and Other Sketches by Saki Clovis on the Alleged Romance of Business It is the fashion nowadays, said Clovis, to talk about the romance of business. There isn't such a thing. The romance has all been the other way. With the idle apprentice, the truant, the runaway, the individual who couldn't be bothered with figures and bookkeeping, and left business to look after itself. I admit that a grocer's shop is one of the most romantic and thrilling things I have ever happened upon. But the romance and thrill are centred in the groceries, not the grocer. The citron and spices and nuts and dates, the barrelled anchovies and Dutch cheeses, the jars of caviar and chest of tea, they carry the mind away to Levantine coast towns and tropic shores, to the old world wharfs and quays of the low countries, to dusty Astrakhan and Farcathay. If the grocer's apprentice has any romance in him, it is not a business education he gets behind the grocer's counter. It is a standing invitation to dream and to wander, and to remain poor. As a child, 
Such places as South America and Asia Minor were brought painstakingly under my notice. The names of their principal rivers and the heights of their chief mountain peaks were committed to my memory, and I was earnestly enjoined to consider them as parts of the world that I lived in. It was only when I visited a large and well-stocked grocer's shop that I realised that they certainly existed. Such galleries of romance and fascination are not bequeathed to us by the businessman. He is only the dull custodian, who talks glibly of Spanish olives and Rangoon rice, a Spain that he has never known or wished to know, a Rangoon that he has never imagined or could imagine. It was the unledged wanderer, the careless-hearted seafarer, the aimless outcast who opened up new trade routes, tapped new markets, brought home samples or cargoes of new edibles and unknown condiments. It was they who brought the glamour and romance to the threshold of business life, where it was promptly reduced to pounds, shillings and pence, invoiced, double-entried, quoted, written off, and so forth. Most of these terms are probably wrong, but a little inaccuracy sometimes serves tons of explanation. On the other side of the account there is the industrious apprentice, who grew up into the businessman, married early and worked late, and lived thousands and thousands of him, in little villas outside big towns. He is buried by the thousand in Kensal Green and other large cemeteries. Any romance that was ever in him was buried prematurely in shop and warehouse and office. Whenever I feel in the least tempted to be businesslike, or methodical, or even decently industrious, I go to Kensal Green and look at the graves of those who died in business. End of section 7 Section 8 The Comments of Moon Ka Moon Ka, cultivator of rice and philosophic virtues, sat on the raised platform of his cane-built house by the banks of the swiftly flowing Irrawaddy. On two sides of the house there was a bright green swamp which stretched away to where the uncultivated jungle growth began. In the bright green swamp, which was really a rice field, when you looked closely at it, bitterns and pond herons and elegant cattle egrets stalked and peered with the absorbed air of careful and conscientious reptile hunters, who could never forget that, while they were undoubtedly useful, they were also distinctly decorative. In the tall reed growth by the riverside, grazing buffaloes showed in patches of dark slaty blue, like palms fallen amid long grass, and in the tamarind trees that shaded Munkar's house, the crows, restless, raucous-throated, and much too many, kept up their incessant afternoon din, saying over and over again all the things that crows have said, since there were crows to say them. Munkar sat smoking his enormous green-brown cigar, without which no Burmese man, woman, or child seems really complete, dispensing from time to time instalments of worldly information for the benefit and instruction of his two companions. The steamer which came up river from Mandalay thrice a week brought Moon Ka a Rangoon news sheet, in which the progress of the world's events was set forth in telegraphic messages, and commented on in pithy paragraphs. Munka, who read these things and retailed them as occasion served to his friends and neighbours, with philosophical additions of his own, was held in some esteem locally as a political thinker. In Burma it is possible to be a politician without ceasing to be a philosopher. His friend Mung Thwa, dealer in teakwood, had just returned downriver from distant Bamo where he had spent many weeks in dignified, unhurried chaffering with Chinese merchants. The first place to which he naturally turned his steps, bearing with him his beetle-box and fat cigar, had been the raised platform of Moon Ka's cane-built house under the tamarind trees. The youthful Moon Shugalai, who had studied in the foreign schools at Mandalay and knew many English words, was also of the little group that sat listening to Munkar's bulletin of the world's health, and ignoring the screeching of the crows. There had been the usual preliminary talk of timber and the rice market and sundry local matters, 
and then the wider and remoter things of life came under review. "'And what has been happening away from here?' asked Moon Thwa of the newspaper reader. "'Away from here' comprised a considerable portion of the world's surface which lay beyond the village boundaries. "'Many things,' said Moon Ka, reflectively, "'but principally two things of much interest, and of an opposite nature. Both, however, concern the action of governments.' Moon Thwa nodded his head gravely, with the air of one who reverenced and distrusted all governments. "'The first thing of which you may have heard on your journeyings,' said Moon Ka, "'is an act of the Indian government, which has annulled the not long ago accomplished partition of Bengal.' "'I heard something of this,' said Moon Thwa, "'from a Madrasi merchant on the boat journey, but I did not learn the reasons that made the government take this step. Why was the partition annulled? Because, said Moon Ka, it was held to be against the wishes of the greater number of the people of Bengal. Therefore the government made an end of it. Moon Thwa was silent for a moment. Is it a wise thing the government has done? he asked presently. It is a good thing to consider the wishes of a people, said Moon Ka. The Bengalis may be a people who do not always wish what is best for them. Who can say? But at least their wishes have been taken into consideration, and that is a good thing. And the other matter of which you spoke? questioned Mung Thwa. The matter of an opposite nature? But the other matter, said Mung Ka, is that the British government has decided on the partition of Britain. Where there has been one parliament and one government, there are to be two parliaments and two governments, and there will be two treasuries and two sets of taxes. Mung Thwa was greatly interested in this news. And is the feeling of the people of Britain in favour of this partition? he asked. Will they not dislike it as the people of Bengal dislike the partition of their province? The feeling of the people of Britain has not been consulted, and will not be consulted, said Mung Ka. The act of partition will pass through one chamber, where the government rules supreme, and the other chamber can only delay it a little while, and then it will be made into the law of the land. But is it wise not to consult the feeling of the people? asked Mung Thwa. Very wise, answered Mung Ka, for if the people were consulted they would say no, as they have always said when such a decree was submitted to their opinion. And if the people said no, there would be an end of the matter, but also an end of the government. Therefore it is wise for the government to shut its ears to what the people may wish. But why must the people of Bengal be listened to, and the people of Britain not listened to? asked Mung Thwa. Surely the partition of their country affects them just as closely. Are their opinions too silly to be of any weight? The people of Britain are what is called a democracy, said Mung Ka. A democracy? questioned Mung Thwa. What is that? A democracy, broke in Mung Shugalai, eagerly, is a community that governs itself according to its own wishes and interests by electing accredited representatives who enact its laws and supervise and control their administration. Its aim and object is government of the community in the interests of the community. Then, said Mung Thwa, turning to his neighbour, if the people of Britain are a democracy, I never said they were a democracy, interrupted Mung Ka placidly. Surely we both heard you, exclaimed Mung Thwa. Not correctly, said Mung Ka. I said they are what is called a democracy. End of section 8 End of The Square Egg and Other Sketches by Saki